Hey everybody, I'm going to be covering uh, chapters 9 and 10 today, 9 and 10, uh, adventure, as all of you saw. This is more about farming and farms, and uh, a lot of this is about, uh, well, kind of downtime for farming in, in Minnesota. There's still plenty of farms, uh, but, well, to look at the example of dairy farms, technically 98% are in some type of financial hardship, right? Um, a lot of this, according to, to our book, is because uh, dairy farms aren't able to upscale the way they are in California. So if you look, uh, from 1950 to 2002, California went from 16 to 559 cows per farm. Minnesota went from 10 to 74 per farm. Uh, and there's, there's not a lot of investment money to upscale. Farmers are, are making what money they can, but uh, if you wanted to upscale, 500 cows require uh, one to two million dollars. Uh, that's just for the building, and another million for the cows. Um, and so we have some some scaling issues here locally in Minnesota. Uh, I might have said this before, but if this had been written a bit later, it would probably go into more detail about how. Um, well, the beer brewing industry in Minnesota, part of the reason it's taken off the way it has is because all this uh, cheap dairy equipment that out of business dairy farmers are, are well, they're, they're going for next to nothing. And it's a lot of the same equipment uh, used for beer brewing. Our author also talks about that there's a problem with uh, laws making it difficult for foreigners to buy farmland and to, to utilize it. This includes people who have immigrated to the state. Uh, there was a, well, that's the population who want to go into farming, want to go into agriculture, right? It's usually immigrant groups uh, because that's often what they did back in the countries that they're coming from. Uh, but the state went into, uh, it felt that it would keep these farms in their own families uh, and it would make it so that the farms weren't all being sold out to like giant agro business but that's not really happening small farms are being bought out by giant farms um let's see a lot of people who do do dairy um well they do it mostly because they have all this alfalfa that they grow as part of a crop rotation uh and it's doesn't sell for a great price, uh, but if you have some amount of dairy, uh, you know, you can feed it to your cows. Uh, and then if nothing else, manure is useful for fertilizer. Um, and so a lot of dairy farmers are kind of operating at a loss, right? They're actually not making up as much money as the costs altogether. Um, let's see, I kind of mentioned some of this each dairy cow requires an acre uh, of hay, acre of corn silage, uh, plus special feed concentrates. And then this little graph here is from our book. And as you can see in it, um, well, Minnesota is doing better than Minnesota, right? Uh, as far as in absolute terms, but California has really eclipsed, uh, well, they eclipsed us a long time ago, but they more recently eclipsed Wisconsin as being one of the main and producers, and again, uh, it's because they have these big scalable uh, abilities, able to expand their operations in ways the farms, farms are more divided and piecemeal here. More pictures from the book. Um, sugar beets, uh, a big crop uh, in part of the state, and of course, North Dakota, uh, as you can tell there. Um, remember this that is the whole area that had uh, a glacial lake uh, so it actually has uh, pretty good soils all along the river there um, if you remember the glacial lake uh, well because it, it, it brought down sediment kind of slowly uh, created some some good good soils in that area Let's see. more pictures from the book are those tires they are just to hold down that tarp. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. 
Um, I would say uh, the collecting of tires uh, for things like this is kind of uh, stopped, especially after there was a giant fire in Andover about 25, 30 years ago. The, you know, you probably don't even think about it. Like you go through tires and you get rid of tires and what happens to those tires? Well, for a long time, just like junk guards would just store them up, great big piles of tires. Uh, but that's quite dangerous and a lot of people warned that, you know, this could be a huge fire and, and people are just kind of like, ah, now nah, whatever. Uh, but there's a gigantic uh, tire fire and that actually changed a lot of the tire regulations in the state. It was famous at the time, you could ask your parents, they may remember the giant tire fire in uh, Andover. <clears throat> uh, not a lot of people know about it. I know about it because I was a city planner for Andover, and so I studied their history, and I looked through all their kind of records about it and kind of what happened. Uh, I also didn't know that that, that that same area was part of a, a toxic Superfund cleanup site. Um, if you're ever driving by Andover and you see a central area that looks like it's all just grass and there's some weird vents that say, do not smoke near these vents, it's because they just buried all the stuff. They just buried all the stuff underneath some dirt. Ah, uh, yeah. Which is, you know, what a lot of places do to their, their garbage. All right, um, oh yeah, sugar beets. Uh, one, of the main sugar, one of the main reasons sugar beets do as well as they do uh, is because the United States has policies to not allow uh, a certain amount of sh sugar to be imported into the country. That keeps our prices higher about two to three times uh, what the sugar prices would otherwise be if uh, we had uh, completely open open markets. Um, sugar beets are also part of a good good rotation. Um, this section also talked about how, well, as you can see from the map, uh, number of Hispanic residents. There's a, there's a reason. You know, we talked before about like, well, this is kind of where the jobs are in general. But farming, you know, that's the reason these are these are larger than zero. Um, started out in the 1920s with seasonal uh, people coming in to help with seasonal farming, uh, and then through time, uh, some some of the populations decided to stay, moved to the central cities, uh, looked for other work. Uh, so it's like I said, it's been about 100 years uh, of Hispanics moving to Minnesota. All right, chapter 10, uh, where the previous chapter was about dairy. This one is about, well, it's titled the Corn Belt, but it's actually about uh, kind of the rest of agriculture uh, in the state. Um, let's see, I would guess I would say one of the main things this chapter talked about is a lot of costs, a lot of costs. Corn is another crop that uh, has an amount of subsidies, uh, otherwise, uh, they would they would go under um, lots of costs and herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, all the kind of modern, uh, including farming equipment. Very often that equipment needs to be updated, and it's extremely expensive. That's again one of the reasons why usually it's the huge agribusinesses that are kind of taking over smaller farms. It's, it's tough for a small farm to mm -hmm. just pay up the money for giant equipment, especially if it's just going to be used for a part of the year. Uh, sometimes they'll try to cut costs by renting out larger equipment, uh, but lots of times the big, the big farms, they don't want to rent out their equipment because, well, they really want those other farms to go out of business so they could buy that land and make it part of their farm, right? <clears throat> Soybeans you see gaining in popularity. Um, increasingly, Land is rented for farming. Um, let's see, a little map of corn and soybean as percentage of cropland harvested. You can see it's mostly in the south part of the state. Uh, soils are, are yet different over there. That wasn't part of the, the glacial lake. Uh, not that it has bad soils, but it just has different types, different types of inputs needed. <clears throat> um, this chapter also talks quite a bit about, well, farming, farming population getting older, rural towns, the average age being older and older, uh, and the younger generation tending to want to move toward the central cities. 
Uh, this is kind of a story that's been going on for maybe 200 years in the United States. Uh, and not just the United States, worldwide this is a trend. If y'all take my, my world geography class, talk about it a lot. Uh, mostly because same thing is happening in the rest of the world that is happening here, which is uh, small farmers just kind of can't make ends meet. The equipment and stuff costs a lot. Uh, and younger generation are moving to cities. <clears throat> um, average size of farm here. Do you see full owners, part-time owners, uh, part owner farmed. Um, what, what all this means is uh, a lot of people who are farmers uh, through time uh, as they've been able to make kind of less and less money they just start working part-time at other jobs to sustain themselves, right? They're just not quite making enough. Um, some people, people refer to these then as hobby farms. If your other job is what gets you most your money and then the farm is just kind of what you do and that kind of doesn't make too much money. Uh, average age of Minnesota farm owners. As you see, been going up since, you know, 80. Um, I don't know why it went down for a while there. Uh, hmm, I should look that up. Well, anyway, uh, a lot of rural areas have uh, what are termed passive income earners, which means they're living on Social Security, they're living on retirement, they're doing some amount of farming that they can, uh, but it's, it's, these trends continue today. <clears throat> Um, well, to qualify as a family farm, you need to sell at least uh, half a million per year, right? Uh, which as you can see, 4.5% of farmers do that. Uh, so a lot of farms are just not making that much money, in a nutshell. Um, let's see. Percentage of farmers who have to work off farm 100 days or more. Right? You see this kind of constant trend happening where most of your money, most of your time is going to be spent elsewhere. <clears throat> um, and you can see, well, through time, what we have seen in all these trends is a, a decreasing number of total farms. And again, that's because the larger farms uh, will buy them up when they can. Uh, sometimes it's difficult because there'll be a little piecemeal little farms here and there, and those ones are the type that will just kind of go under and you know you're driving out in the country somewhere and you'll drive by uh, a farmhouse that is just kind of like the farmland look like it's not being used and the farm itself the buildings have all decayed and whatnot um, that's you know like I said if they can't kind of get that section of land connected to the larger farm uh, then they might not might not just pay for it um, Let's see, ethanol, right? Ethanol, for a long time, this is gonna be the big thing that would bring crops such as corn kind of back. Um, and at the beginning, there was lots of subsidies because there was a feeling that it just needed to get off the ground. Uh, and it could be a fuel source. It could be technically a green fuel source since, since we created by growing stuff. Um, but it's never really been able to get away from needing the subsidies uh, just the, the facilities for it and it takes uh, just something as simple as, as water supplies because you need a lot of steam power to actually convert uh, your plant material into ethanol. Uh, it takes more money and fuel uh, than you get from it. So that still has subsidies because it's still, the thought is that it still just needs to get off the ground although this has been going on for like 20 plus years. Um, let's see. Well, a lot of farmers uh, mixed up, mixed it up with what they have to try to um, branch out, make some more money if they could. Uh, as of the publication of this book, we are the number one turkey state, uh, the third hawk state, and the 11th egg state. <clears throat> Map of, of turkey sold. 
as you can imagine, turkeys uh, was very seasonal, right? Because it's all Thanksgiving, people get turkeys, and very often the rest of the year, people did not, people did not. Um, but since places built up the capacity for turkeys, uh, and then, you know, those buildings and everything, will you have it all year? Uh, that's when individual companies started trying to promote, especially trying to uh, have name brands of turkeys to get people to think of that name, not just for Thanksgiving, but other times of year. Right, aren't there names, of, what's the name of like famous turkey? If you're like, I want to get that turkey. Butterball. There you go, All right? Name recognition means a lot. Um, so they just started providing it year round and started doing ad campaigns about like how it's healthier than lots than, than beef and some other things, right? And it's like, well, it's true. <clears throat> All right, so let's see how many people have got in the class today. One, two, three, four, five. All right, well, what we're gonna do today, we're gonna do some classroom work. Uh, let's see here, gotta get, gonna have you break off into groups, which means I'm gonna come out with the cards. Yeah, if you take a card, I'm trying to shuffle these right now. So in groups, well, I'm also handing out a little reading. Uh, what we're going to be doing is looking at how difficult it is to kind of read history, read people who have written historically, uh, and make sense. Right? Uh, it makes sense of these histories. So I actually got a copy of one of the most well-known authors of the 1850s and got a couple of her little writings and in groups. I'm gonna, well, read through it, try to interpret it. By that I mean, you know, there's an expression that history is a foreign country. Uh, in the future is the undiscovered country. Well, when you read this, you'll see why there's a phrase that says uh, history is like a foreign country. The lingo and trying to figure out what's being said will have definite ups and downs. Did I miss anybody for a card? Ah. Sorry about that. All right. Who has diamonds? Who has diamonds? Diamonds, diamonds, diamonds. Oh, diamonds are definitely clustered here. So diamonds come up here and meet. How about hearts? Who has hearts? Hearts is kind of all over. Sure. How about hearts? Here, here, because there's empty spaces. Pardon me. How about spades? Who has spades? Spades, huh? Well, I don't want to smush you in too much with that group. Sure, why right, right there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how about uh, clubs? Who has clubs? Clubs. Uh, how about back corner? Because you're all spread out. Clubs in the back corner. And has everyone gotten a copy of the readings? All right. 